The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Sign Institute, I want to thank all of you so much for joining us for Governor Hogan's third seminar, Whatever Happened and How Do We Fix It? How American politics got so crazy. My name is Lindy Murphy, and I have the privilege of being one of Governor Hogan's student associates. Today we have four amazing panelists, and I am honored to introduce some of them for you today. First and foremost, please help me in welcoming Governor Larry Hogan. Luckily, we've gotten the chance to get to know Governor Hogan better through his last two seminars, diving into his passion for bipartisanship and his personal experiences with crises while in office. As a refresher, serving as the 62nd governor of Maryland, Governor Hogan led the state through tumultuous times from violent riots in Baltimore to the COVID-19 pandemic and navigating January 6th. Governor Hogan is well-versed in the world of politics, particularly the overly polarized environment we seem to exist in today. <clears throat> Known for his popularity as a Republican governor in the bluest state in America, Governor Hogan has never ceased to emphasize the need for bipartisanship, teamwork, and decision-making to efficiently serve in U.S. government. It is these qualities and experiences that make him an incredible resource for us to understand the political climate today and what needs to be done to return to governing effectively. Please, again, join me in welcoming Governor Larry Hogan. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Frederick J. Ryan Jr., who is the former CEO of the Washington Post, former co-founder and CEO of Politico. Mr. Ryan's diverse career in politics ranges from being a White House staffer to being your newspaper publisher. After his time in the White House, Mr. Ryan became former President Reagan's chief of staff in addition to being responsible for the president's activities, Mr. Ryan served as his representative in meetings with leaders and officials from around the world. Currently, Mr. Ryan serves as chairman of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute and is leading the launch of the new Center on Civility and Democracy. Mr. Ryan's perspective on the state of American politics is uniquely formed by his, both his work as a staffer and his work as a journalist. His dedication to accountability, and freedom for the press paired with his extensive experience in politics makes his point of view one worth paying particular attention to. Join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Fred Ryan Jr. Finally, I'm honored to introduce one of our own, Ms. Molly O'Rourke, who is executive in residence in the School of Communications here at AU, the chair of the Institutional Review Board, and most importantly, she serves as a senior advisor to the Sign Institute. Ms. O'Rourke is a scholar whose experience lies in American politics and the dynamics that have led to its current state. With her experience in the field of public opinion research, for example, writing a column in The Hill titled Behind the Numbers, as well as her work with groups like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Ms. O'Rourke brings an invaluable perspective to our discussion today. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Molly O'Rourke. Now it is my pleasure to hand it over to Anshu to introduce the rest of our panel. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming to today's side event. I'm Anshu Pokru, and I'm one of Governor Hogan's students associates. 
It is with great pleasure that I stand before you all today to introduce two accomplished individuals. First, join me in welcoming our lead student associate, Rohan Singh. Rohan is a fourth year honor student here at American University, majoring in international studies. Rowan has contributed a lot to Sign Institute, being one of the polling project advisory and student advisory board members. His advocacy for human rights extends for more than just passion as he interned at the U.S. mission to the U.N. Human Rights Counselor in Switzerland under the U.S. Department of State. His impressive resume continues where he is also a former White House student. Rohan demonstrates strong leadership with, within our group as he works very hard behind the scenes to make sure these events turn out great. Now, join me in extending a warm welcome to Amelia Chase Alsevar, who is currently leading um, HECO Redevelopment Partners uh, Strategic Initiatives Across Government Relations, Community Relations, and Stakeholder. Amelia brings with uh, her a wealth of experience boasting over 15 years of strategic, uh, strategic communications, public affairs, and senior management roles across diverse states in our great nation. Before joining um, HRP, Amelia served as the chief, uh, chief to staff to uh, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, making history as the first woman to hold this esteemed position. In this capacity, she played a crucial role in managing Maryland's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and developed the state's substantial $60 million budget. Her impressive career also includes as the Communications Director for the Republican Governors Association, Communications Director for Governor Hogan, Press Secretary for Texas Governor Greg Abbott, and Vice President of the Digital Communications Consult uh, Consultancy, Heinz Communications. Amelia holds a bachelor's degree from George Washington's University Elite School of International Affairs and underscoring her commitment to excellence in her field. So thank you and welcome Rohan and Amelia. Uh, Well, Anshu and Lindy, thank you very much. Didn't they do a great job on this introduction? Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think uh, Lindy and Anshu, you know, they're, they're pretty impressive. I don't know how we're going to follow that. Act, but, uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming here today. This is uh, my third and, and uh, final session here at American University. And I uh, especially want to thank the incredible uh, panelists that we have here today, uh, Fred Ryan, uh, the chairman of the Ronald Reagan Foundation and Institute, uh, uh, Molly O'Rourke, who you're all familiar with, the executive in residence, uh, senior sign institute advisor, and Rohan Singh, who's he's the, been the leader of our terrific team of, you know, these guys carried the whole thing. I didn't have to do much work at all uh, as my as my fellow advisors and uh, supporters. So Rohan, thank you for uh, for being a part of this discussion, and and I want to thank each and every one of uh, of the students uh, who have, have really been. Uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know you and to work with you. And then uh, certainly, uh, last but not least, uh, I want to you know give a, a shout out to my incredible former chief of staff Amelia, who I can tell you that uh, you know she's going to be moderating the discussion today. But she's been moderating me for years <laughs> and uh, probably a huge part of our success and helped us through a lot of crises. And I think I was proud to have her as the first woman chief of staff in the governor's office in Maryland. And she was, you know, I, I, I we had one of our former chiefs of staff with us last time. And I, I would say it in, even in front of him that Amelia was the best chief of staff we ever had. And I'm happy <laughs> to have her. Um, so yeah, thank, I want to thank, take a moment. Although I don't uh, see her here yet, I want to give a shout out and thank Amy Dacey. Uh, and, here. Huh? Oh, Amy, oh, Amy was in the back row. I, I'm, I would have given you a shout out even if you weren't here, Amy, but I want to thank her and the Sign Institute uh, for giving me this uh, incredible opportunity to host some of these important uh, discussions. In our, in our previous session, we, we had a terrific conversation uh, with a couple of great governors, Governor Bill Cox and Governor Jared Polis who were the chair and vice chair of the National Governors Association. It was a great discussion on disagree better. Uh, we explored, you know, how you can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, you, you really can passionately disagree on issues without vilifying one another or questioning your uh, somebody's integrity or patriotism just because they have, they have a different opinion. Uh, in, a, in our most recent session, I brought together 
a couple of my key staffers, Chris Shank, who's in the back row back here, and another former communications director, chief of staff, Mark, and we talked about um, leading through crisis and uh, decision making and communicating and, and uh, trying to figure out a way to get things done, reaching across the aisle and putting aside petty partisan politics. And I'm really looking forward to this important uh, discussion here this afternoon. Um, it uh, has been an honor uh, to have the chance to meet so many brilliant students here at American University. I really mean that. Um, in, in today's discussion, we're going to explore what young Americans are experiencing and feeling and, and how the, the leaders of today uh, can better engage with all of you who are our leaders of tomorrow. And uh, you know, despite all of the divisiveness and dysfunction, uh, the toxic politics, and all the problems that we face in America, these weeks that I've had to spend with you here at American University really have given me a great deal of optimism and hope for our future. So thank you all very much, and thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Governor Hogan, and it's it's really an honor to moderate such a great discussion among really, really distinguished panelists. Um, I know I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to try to project. Uh, Chris, could you give me like a, a, a thumbs up means bad, like, like you can't hear me? Like, maybe give me a thumbs down if you can't hear me. Anyone else, feel free to raise your hand if you can't hear me. Amelia's a little taller than me. I pushed this way down. <laughs> Cindy and I right. and you did that. But... Tell me you guys are really close, but I can't read my notes if I'm this close. So uh, looking forward to a great discussion today. So I think we're going to start off really setting the table with the tremendous work um, in public opinion research that Molly has spearheaded. So Molly, your science senior advisor, as has been said, you work closely with the Science Institute during the con during conducting your, your public opinion research regarding views from young Americans on what does the American dream mean to all of you and how we can you know, use that to inform our discussion. Do you, could you just run us through a few of the highlights from your research? Yeah, sure. Um, do you want me to stand yeah, sure. or sit? Okay. Um, thank you all. I, I um, will just take a few minutes to kind of set the context for the conversation today. Uh, the poll that we did, uh, we conducted um, last summer. We'll be doing another one this summer on the 20, important 2024 elections coming up. Um, but I think a lot of these uh, findings are really kind of evergreen in that they're not sort of just reacting to kind of the current news, but really very kind of deeply embedded uh, feelings. And um, one of the important things uh, that we're proud of about the poll is that we had some um, terrific partners, the Close Up Foundation, the Millennial Action Project, uh, Generation Lab, and then we had the, um, a group of student advisors. And so pleased that we had Rohan contributing so that it really was a survey that was authentic to um, the respondents who we were trying to capture. So I, I, I just have a few slides to run through again to sort of set the context. The, this first slide is really um, a headline that isn't surprising to any of us. We are all hearing so much about the mental health crisis for young Americans today, and it's very real. And there's, you know, a, a poll after poll can provide you with different demonstrations of this. Um, in um, We started off by asking uh, the kind of dominant experience of this generation and just to, um, the, the, uh, the survey was done of 18 to 34 year olds and um, uh, not just registered voters. We So that's some of what we'll talk about is the difference between those who are registered and politi politically engaged and those who aren't. So it's a nationally representative sample of people, uh, Americans under the age of 35. We asked them before we got to this question, what their dominant experience um, is, like what defines this generation? and um, feeling stress, pressure, and being overwhelmed at the pace of their lives is by far the dominant experience. 85% of respondents said that that description applies to them, and the intensity is especially strong among young women. So it's like 10 points higher among, it's, it's high among everyone, but it's especially poignant for um, young, women, young women. This slide is another um, demonstration we asked to, we, um, the survey was done online and we gave respondents the opportunity to identify a few traits that um, really characterize them and their generation. We tried to provide a mix of both positive and, and um, uh, negative words. And you can see 
in a tier all onto itself is that kind of stressed and overwhelmed. So 44% um, chose that as one of the top two attributes. Um, and the next most cited is positive, creative, and entrepreneurial and innovative. Um, but that's a full 20 points lower than being stressed and, and overwhelmed. And then you see with the arrows here, there's some other kind of important contradictions to sort out. Young people are equally likely to say that they feel connected and informed um, as they are saying that they feel lonely and isolated. And you see on the left, 11% say re uh, describe themselves um, one of the top two characteristics as being resilient, but they also, there's this trend toward feeling discouraged and hopeless. So there's really a lot to sort through. I mean, we're coming out, still sorting out the effects of COVID and we'll be talking about some of the forces that make these contradictions so acute among this generation, from social media to what's going on with the polarization in our country today. So we can go to the next slide. I, I like this in particular because it's kind of a mix of both optimistic and somewhat kind of pessimistic. And I think good you know, polling should reflect an accurate picture. And there's always kind of a mix of both. But the first thing you notice is that actually young people feel pretty optimistic about their own lives. 63% um, uh, describe themselves as either very optimistic or somewhat optimistic. You see how that's broken out. Um, it, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, differences um, among some of the subgroups, but there's really a contradiction between feeling hopeful and um, somewhat optimistic about your own life compared to just 33% say that about the country. And that's really um, you know, a very, very big difference to think through. And one of the things we hope to sort through on this panel is to understand what accounts for that 30 point difference where young Americans are saying, well, I think I'm doing okay, but I'm really worried about what else, what's going on around me. And um, you know, that, that 30 point differential is very, very significant. And I think has a lot of implications for our elections, for our political leadership, um, why uh, young Americans feel kind of so disconnected and worried about what's going on uh, across the country. We can go to the next slide. These next two slides are, well, I'll say they're all my favorite because they reveal really important things. But um, we um, uh, asked um, the premise of this uh, question, again, this was done online so that respondents could handle this long kind of list of items. We asked about 13 uh, specific areas and the, the um, overall theme of the poll was to, to talk about kind of what constitutes the American dream, how do they see it relative to their parents. And I think this, for the most part, kind of defied expectations a little bit in that on 12 of the 13 measures, young Americans say, I expect to be better, I have a better experience than my parents' generation. So the opportunity to get a great education, the freedom to choose the job I want, um, having you know deep, meaningful personal relationships, you can see over on the right the kind of net better by double digit margins. Young Americans say, actually, we're expecting we're going to have. I'm expecting to have a better experience than my parents. The one item that you see highlighted in yellow is um, the exception to the rule, which is having a functional government that represents all Americans. And so on that. Young Americans are, you know, really divided and very ambivalent about whether they're going to have a better experience or a worse experience. So the point is, I think on this, of these 13 items, this really stands out. And then we can go to the next slide and you see it again. Um, we asked um, respondents, you know, when you think about your goals for your American dream defined, you know, in, in your own way, um, how did these various things either help you or hurt you? And again, we presented them with this list of multiple factors. There's nine factors here. And <clears throat> all of the factors, there's a net positive, right? That they're more helpful than they are hurtful, except the 21 point deficit of our political system, including the way we choose our elected officials. So, you know, you, you go from family and friends, where by a 51 point margin, 68 to 17%, young people say, that helps me. That's that's helping me on my path to pursuing what I think of uh, or the American dream for myself. And um, on policy, uh, uh, that's right in the middle, you see the um, policy laws 
other things like personal freedom and economic opportunity, there's just a very um, kind of uh, split result. But the only one that is heavily net negative is the political system and our current um, structure of political leadership. So that, along with the previous slide, I think really kind of identifies or highlights what we hope to be talking about here today, which is not just diagnosing the problem, which is an important thing to do. I think the problem is pretty clearly diagnosed, but how do you move, how do you understand the causes of it enough to be able to move past it? So we have a couple of other um, slides. Um, I, I think this is really enc encouraging in that um, we, we try and do polling, not just to diagnose problems, but to also try and identify solutions and opportunities. And so we ask kind of thinking forward, what are some of the um, uh, 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 things that are meaningful to you when you think about uh, trying to pursue change? And there's this kind of, I, I, I think maybe stereotype or conventional wisdom of, of dem the demographic in this room that, you know, the, um, they're a little soft or maybe sometimes they're called snowflakes and they, if they just want things that are kind of easy and not, you know, they want safe spaces. And this, I really like this result because I feel like it really challenges that. And what respondents are saying is, I see what's at the very bottom of, of what they pick. It's easy and doesn't require a lot of effort. That's at the bottom of what they want. What they really are looking for is, I want to be effective. I want to have an impact. I want to know that I'm directly helping people in real time so that it's not kind of just an investment in the future, which they believe in, but you know, really changing things for the here and now creating the kind of social or political change I want to see. So I think this challenges the conventional wisdom in a really good way to say, no, don't, don't shy away from making this a tough assignment. They're up, you all, you're up for a tough assignment. Um, you're, you're saying you're willing to work hard. Um, and so let's think of what are the solutions that you can work at. And then um, finally, uh, this slide, we wanted to kind of understand because young Americans see political leadership as so broken um, in this country from the slides I, I presented earlier, we asked about, well, what is important to you when you think about qualities, not about the policy agenda, but really about the qualities. And I think here, um, you know, you get some sort of traditional characteristics or qualities. You want people to be intelligent and knowledgeable and have the experience to do the job. Um, service to others is very important. But I really like some of the other things that rose to the top for these young people, which is the ability to listen and consider other perspectives. So part of leadership for this generation is listening and understanding different perspectives, not imposing from above, but listening first and then leading, demonstrating genuine compassion and kindness to others. I think that's pretty distinctive. Um, also, the, um, um, the idea of being authentic and genuine, even if it means making mistakes. And so I think you know the barometer for young Americans is pretty high in terms of their smell test of what's real and what's authentic. And they, they want people who are willing to get past the talking points and willing to really have the, the difficult conversations. And then I think I have one final slide, which is to say there is clearly an agenda that young Americans want to have, whether it's for the 2024 election or it's you know policy being considered by Congress and their state legislatures. There are some very basic things. And the first is having a safe and healthy place to live and an environment. And by you know, safe is uh, some of the questions that I didn't show the results of were um, specific references to gun violence and how that has shaped the trauma of gun violence has really shaped this generation. Um, and a healthy environment with considerations about the impact of, of climate change, higher education, affordability, quality education, Healthcare. So there are um, uh, here a whole list of very substantive issues that young Americans care about and say they want to prioritize. But the disconnect is really not seeing the leadership that's addressing it in the kind of authentic um, uh, way of listening to people and then presenting a vision. So um, I hope that's kind of helpful in terms of then the conversation that we're going to have about how do we unpack this and how do we improve it. really fascinating, right? 
So I have a specific question for each panelist, but before I go to that, maybe just open it up to, to get some reaction. You know, how did Molly's findings um, either confirm, you know, the way you're thinking about our divisions and how to address them or challenge assumptions? I, I know it's going to challenge some of my assumptions um, about this generation and, you know, how they see political engagement. It's uh, open it up to the panel. Well, you know, first of all, Molly, uh, thank you. It was, it's, uh, it's a fascinating poll and some of it sort of did surprise me. I'm sorry. Didn't have a mic. Uh, nope. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, one thing that you know, it may come as a surprise to all of you, but I'm over 35, and but I, I was surprised that I feel exactly like a lot of young people do, uh, because I'm somewhat hopeful uh, for for the for the future, but I'm also, you know, completely fed up and concerned about the broken political system and you know the divisiveness and dysfunction, and uh, so. I, I feel kind of cool now because I feel, you know, I think like a young person. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I was, I was impressed. My first impression was the fact that I didn't know that people your age were as hopeful about we're going to have a, you know, a future that we're going to do better than our parents because, you know, it, it's a tough time. Mm -hmm. There are huge problems and issues, and you know, I started out my opening remarks by saying how it gave me hope to be with you. And, but it's, it's, it's just reflected in that poll that young people have an optimistic outlook, uh, but they're also really concerned about our broken political system. Anyone else want to weigh in? Oh, maybe I'll go to, um, to, to Fred. Um, so Mr. Ryan, one of the objectives of the Ronald Reagan Foundation Center on Civility and Democracy, which you lead, is to bridge divides by identifying these fault lines that exist and then how to bring those stakeholders together to, to bridge that gap. Um, can you talk a little bit about, in your work, where do you see those largest divides and, and where do you see opportunities for success in bridging the gap? Sure, thanks, Amelia. But let me just start by thanking Governor Hogan for inviting me today and for the, the Science Center. I, I follow what you've done. I know this is part of a continuing series and it's just really great to see the program and to see the level of interest here in it. Um, I would say one thing, and well, I actually, Governor, I was just like, I guess I just missed it too. I was just over the cusp of the yeah. 34 year old. Like, uh, but I, I was, uh, it was very encouraging to see the level of optimism uh, because I, I think uh, people will be surprised to see that. But secondly, there are a lot of reasons not to be optimistic. So it's great to see the level of optimism that this generation has. Um, and I'll, I'll answer your question in one second, but one other thing that you, you pointed out that, that kind of got my attention too, where you simultaneously had people being lonely, but connected and informed. And I mean, my take on that is, and it kind of comes with the problem is people are being informed digitally alone. Uh, and so they're, and they're connected because they're online, but they're lonely because there's not the level of human interaction. And that, that is, is, I think, and when we talk about the divides, that's a contributing I think a major contributor, you know, almost if you think about your lives, almost each level that you are removed from being eye to eye in person, the level of the ease of being difficult or attacking or, or, or being aggressive in, in, in increases. And I, you know, it's, a, you know, a couple of examples. If you're face to face, you might say something. If you're sending something in an email or a text, or if you're on a, a digital platform on, on social media where you have a, not even your own name on it. That's just like license to go um, to, to really get aggressive or a, a couple of other examples. If you it, it, they say um, the, the, the second shortest measurement of time in the world is the time in New York between the, the light turning green and the car behind you honk. That, that's the second shortest. The, the shortest is the time between that car honking and you giving them the finger. Which is, <laughs> but the point is the, the level of being removed. You somewhat you hear about these road rage incidents. If someone cuts someone off, you don't know who's in that car. It's anonymous. But if you were pulling out of your driveway and your neighbor was pulling in front of you, you would say, "Well, of course, please go this way." So I think these levels, and we're we're seeing more and more uh, ability to say negative things with the veil of uh, anonymity. Um, and one thing that we can do on that, by the way, one thing at the Washington Post we did is we in comments after a story there'll be a comment, and someone will do a very thoughtful comment. And then the next person will say with some anonymous name, you know, you deserve to die. Okay, how does that conversation continue from there? It's kind of hard. So we require people to use their, their real emails and their real names. And just that alone dramatically improved the quality of the comments. Um, but you asked about the divisions and we've been looking at a lot of research and uh, we're seeing divisions, but they're not 
the type of divisions we've always had where people are divided by ideas. Uh, you and your best friend may share totally different views on a lot of issues, but they're still your best friend or were. Today, because of the disagreement on ideas, we are in different camps. We don't trust that person. We think uh, surveys have come out showing now that people feel that uh, if the opposite party wins in this election, a large number feel that the country will be permanently damaged. So there's this idea that your idea, we differ on ideas, but you're a worse person because of it. And as a result, you're not able to find areas of common ground. And, and uh, one last point I'll make is if you're deliberate about it, uh, as uh, Governor Hogan was in, in a state where you're the Republican and you're a, you're a legislature Democrat, you have to find common ground. But how often today do you hear, when particularly talking about Capitol Hill, they'll say, well, the Republicans are in real trouble because for this bill to pass, it's gonna require Democratic votes. Well, that's the way the system should work. I mean, don't you want these people and vice versa? Uh, it's gonna take votes to the other party. So um, the fault lines you're seeing, the divisions, uh, ideology, there, I mean, there, there are a lot of ways we're divided by ideologically. Uh, there are uh, racial divisions. There are certainly uh, geographic divisions, um, and all of which I think are contributing to the point that I think caught all of our eyes that the lack of trust in government and the belief that, the, that it's not really working for young people. Well, thank you. Um, I'll actually pivot off of that to talk about one of the specific issues where we, we see divides and see indicators in, in how um, individuals, both of all ages, will act politically. You know, Governor Hogan, I'll direct this to you. Education, poll after poll, is shown as the number one indicator for how people will vote. And, you know, often there's, there's fault lines along those education divisions, right? Um, you were a leader in office on, uh, find, on on promoting alternative pathways and skills-based hiring. You know, we're here in a university setting today. Theoretically, everyone here wants to wants to learn, but you know, how can we break down those barriers for for those that may not have this opportunity? So, could you talk a little bit about what you did in Maryland, Governor, and then maybe you know how that could inform some of our uh, political decisions to, to you know to bring people closer together of varying education backgrounds. For sure. For, uh, first of all, um, let me just say that I agree with every word that Fred just said. Um, it, it made some really important points, and, and, I, and I agree with that that's a big part of the division in America. Is the, it's inflamed by the social media and the kind of uh, the, the anonymity and the ability to like attack people. Um, you know, politics wasn't on. You talk about, you know, they're saying they, they criticize you if you try to get something done by reaching across the aisle. You know, I worked for the 70% Democratic legislature to get things done. I wouldn't have gotten anything done unless I listened and talked and tried to find a middle ground. And in Washington, they seem to just be more interested in, you know, performative politics or, or saying crazy things on social media or cable TV, and they're not really focused on solutions. And that's a big part of the problem. People are obviously, I don't think it's just young people that are losing faith in our institutions and in our politics, because I'm an old dude and I'm losing faith in some of our <laughs> institutions and our politics in Washington. But yeah, the divide um, between, um, People that are college educated and non college is a, is a political, huge political divide. Um, we, we took step, look, I, we put record funding into our university system every year. We, we put record funding into our community colleges. We put eight years in a row uh, record funding for K through 12 education and pre K. Um, but we also uh, said that, you know, not the pathway to success is not always the same, and that there are people who didn't need or didn't want to, or weren't able to go to get a, a four-year college degree. And there are tremendous career paths and opportunities for people uh, who have a, a high school education or an AA degree from a community college. And one of the things we did was um, we started, uh, you know, I think 28 different new, brand new apprenticeship programs, not only the apprenticeships and in, in the trades, the building trades, which we also expanded, but in things like cybersecurity, where you could get a great job with a certificate or a two-year degree, and you, you know, you wouldn't have to go to college. You wouldn't have to take on all the student debt. You know, there are people that just they, they, they can't afford to go through that. We made, we tried to make college more affordable, but we also had, you know, pathways to that, that you could go get a great career without having to take on that debt and to, and to spend all of your time in college. And people are making great money in some of these fields without doing it. The other thing I think what maybe Amelia is getting at with her question is that um, we found that there was a paper ceiling uh, that that 
people were being denied the opportunity to apply for a job simply because they didn't have a piece of paper or credentials, even though they had tremendous life experience or work experience, or they served in the military, or they, they really could do a lot of the jobs, uh, especially in IT and, and cyber and, and the healthcare fields when they're, they're technicians and whatnot. And so in state government, um, I was the first governor in America to remove the requirement for a four-year degree for 20,000 state jobs, I think. And we were having difficulty filling the jobs after COVID. And there are many jobs that they, we, 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 we took commensurate work experience. So giving uh, people a better income and a better opportunity, even if they didn't have the chance to go to college, was it was now, I think, 18 states have followed us. Companies are starting to do it. You know, certainly it's, it's not trying to denigrate. You guys are really brilliant and getting great degrees from a great institution. But we, we there are it's not for everyone. You know, I uh, I went to uh, Harvard and, and, and talked about this at a uh, at a seminar there. And I mean, they the, 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 the dean of the school was like, I actually agree with everything that the governor just said, uh, because not everyone can go to Harvard. Not everyone can attend at you. But they do deserve to have uh, the opportunity to get a great job and work hard and support a family. Thank you, Governor. Um, Molly, I'm going to circle back to you. Uh, beyond the traditional partisan divisions, you've delved into life experiences in your research. Um, what life experiences did you find create division on how people view politics in our institutions? And you know, maybe specifically, you had some demographic research in there. So what demographics did you find were the furthest apart in how they responded to these questions? Yeah, I, there's a lot of emphasis on partisan divisions, and those are you know, the increased polarization, partisan polarization across the country. But just what we've been talking about in terms of other gaps and cleavage lines and experiences, I think COVID really did, um, we, we were heading in the direction anyway of kind of rethinking the role of higher education, but COVID really um, caused us to kind of do that in an intense way. I, I don't need to tell you, you were uh, either in college or in high school at the time. It um, affected our ability to, um, uh, to teach students online classes weren't for everybody, students took, time off and thought, is this really worth it anyway to be getting something, a degree online if it's not meaningful to me? Um, but one of the experiences, I mean, when you think about kind of rounding out and the governor just mentioned some of those life experiences, we found out through our polling that um, those uh, young Americans who don't necessarily or don't don't have a college experience and don't plan to, right? Uh, uh, maybe they'll have, um, uh, community college experience, but don't think they'll have a four-year degree. The military experience, the, the the experience of COVID and being responsible for a family member was like a whole new thing that happened during COVID. And when you think about the skills or the judgment and maturity and patience and wisdom that it takes to be a caregiver for a family member, an older person, or uh, so I think it's provided us with an opportunity to really rethink how do we evaluate things? Is a piece of paper meaningful? It is in a lot of ways, but how do we um, make sure that we're giving weight to experiences that are also very meaningful, but the people who have them feel a little left out of the system. They don't feel that those things are being valued or being prioritized highly enough. It's fascinating. Um, Rohan is the only person up here who is eligible to take this poll. <laughs> this one should yeah, I'm here. Um, but you're on the front lines here, right? And so can you just, I'd love to hear just general reaction, you know, where you see the divides among your peers um, as you're, you know, you're going through this, this academic experience and, you know, maybe you start to pivot to like, how can we do better? Absolutely. So um, I will say I am a product of the Virginia Community College System. So I have community college experience. Um, and I think that opened my eyes in many ways that I didn't really realize about academia. I think there's, um, there's when specifically talking about barriers with education, there's many layers to it. Um, there's there were a lot of people who I was going to school with who had full families, and you know they might have been the working uh, during the day, taking classes at night, or vice versa. And when you're going to a four year institution, I think the idea is that you are moving away from home. School is your whole life. You'll try to get a job on the side, maybe for a little extra cash. That's not always realistic when you have to be part of the backbone of your family or the backbone of your family. Um, and so I think that there's so many barriers to education that people just don't talk about. 
um, which is very important. And I think taking advantage of the experience that people have outside of the classroom is a big deal. Um, I've loved my time at AU. I'm almost done. I'm graduating in May, fingers crossed. Um, and I'm very glad that I was able to come here. Um, but it is absolutely the most expensive piece of paper that I think I'll touch in my life. Um, and so the thing is that um, while my classes have been extremely important in shaping my view and the way that I look at the world and how I approach different issues, I think a lot of my education that I think is going to be extremely useful to me is the real world experience that I was able to have, a lot of which I would not have been able to get had I not said, yes, I'm currently enrolled in a four year program. So it's just one of those things where there's a lot of room that we have as a country to want more. And I think that's where, even though there's a lot of doom and gloom, I think that as young people, we were taught in our history classes, I think starting in maybe the first grade, that the reason why this country was founded was because we wanted more. Um, and I think that we've reached a stage where maybe we want just a little more than previous generations. And that's a possibility. Maybe we want exactly the same things, but just in the modern age. Um, and I think that leads people to sometimes think that we are snowflakes, that we just because we want things easy. It's not that we want things easy. It's just that we see structural barriers and we want to knock them down. Um, and so wanting more is, I think, one of the most American things that you could ask for. We have always wanted more. We've always wanted to make progress. And I think we're just in the same place um, as a generation. Um, in terms of divides, I think that when it comes to social media, which is something that um, you discussed, I think that anonymity is definitely a part of it, but I don't think we've ever been in a time where information is so readily accessible. And on top of it, that information being so quick. Um, I am on TikTok, very controversial, um, but truly those five to 10 second videos have made my attention span worse than that of a squirrel. Um, I cannot focus on anything for very long. If I have to watch a video that's 10 minutes, I'm putting it at 2x speed and just getting through it. Um, and it's just, that's what I become. Like my attention span is that low. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to kind of talk about when it comes to social media, because you are able to take in so much information so fast and react to it equally as quickly. And that's not something that we've been able to do before. Um, you know, and past generations and past lives. I think so many, I'm a little bit of an older Gen Z, I'm 25, that happened yesterday. Um, thank you. Um, and so with some people, like they grew up with a screen in front of them 24 seven. I did not have that. I had a little bit of time where I did not have a screen in front of me. Um, and I think that's impacted my view a little bit, but when you all, when you are able to hide behind anonymity, and on top of it, you're able to get this information and process it so quickly. It makes you react just as quickly. And the thing is that the way all these websites are created, their algorithms, it's that if you interact with something or stay on a video for too long, you press like on something, it's gonna send you more posts that are like that. And suddenly you're stuck in what is the corner of X or the corner of TikTok or a corner of Facebook but you feel like that's the whole world, that the whole world feels this way. And that leads you to, again, make decisions based on what you think the whole world also feels, when realistically you maybe have a fraction of the population that exists in front of you. Um, and that definitely leads to divides because suddenly you're getting this like comfort, this dopamine from all these people who are like, yeah, I totally agree with you, I'm on the same page. And then you go out in the real world and that's not necessarily the case. And so you want to go back to where you're comfortable. And I think that as uh, not even just as our generation, but I think as a country as a whole, I think we need to feel more confident about discomfort, about being uncomfortable, talking to people who maybe don't have the same views as us, even if it's on hot button issues where, you know, you just feel like it is this way, there's no other way. You have to be able to find that common ground with people and you have to be willing to feel uncomfortable during that conversation. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the barriers are coming in um, and the divides are coming in is not necessarily being willing to seek that discomfort actively. Right, please jump in. I was just gonna say, follow up on what Rohan said and 
agree completely. I mean, a couple of things. First, we know that false information travels faster and further than, than the truth. I mean, that's just been tested. And as you say, the speed at which things come cause the speed of our, our reaction. Um, second thing is um, when we talk about social media versus regular media, social media now is regular media. I mean, there the Washington Post on a given day or New York Times will get five or 10 million people to visit the site. 170 million Americans are on TikTok. Uh, I was at a, an event and did a little inform, informal survey the day that it came out that King Charles had cancer. I was, I was with a group in Hollywood and some entertainment people and media people, and it was a global event that went around the world. So he said, I just have a question. Could we just go around the room and everyone say how they learned that he, King Charles had cancer? And one guy said, I said, well, the Washington Post. Another guy said, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Everyone else in the room was TikTok or Instagram. So people are getting their information. So then the question goes is, if that's where people get information, how do you, particularly your generation, how do you filter out what's true from what is not? And uh, I think that's going to be, uh, I mean, I, I know as, as the statistics show, you're an optimist, you're optimistic as a generation. You can't go into politics or the media without being an optimist or you won't last very long. But there are reasons to be concerned, particularly going forward and even in the immediate future about how much misinformation and disinformation is going to be served on the sites that we count on to get our, our news. And I think it's even immediate headwinds are with the, the a very divided, probably rough presidential campaign coming up. It's gonna be longer than anyone we've ever had. They're usually four or five months, but now with the candidates who decided it's gonna be eight months. And most people are something like say 40% or for one candidate, 40% or for the other candidate, at least 20%. That 20% is trying to determine not who the best candidate is, but who is the least worst candidate. So that means the message is going to be, oh, he's worse than I am for these reasons. So there's gonna be a lot of that type of information. And the other one that your generation is gonna to have to deal with, all of us are, but you, you've, uh, at, at this point in your lives uh, is with AI driven misinformation. It is, I think the most effective tool that can be deployed to divide us as a society and as a democracy. You heard last week, uh, the uh, intelligence community leaders, the director of national intelligence said that China and Russia both have specific programs designed to divide American society. And it, the, the disinformation via uh, digital platforms, I said, is the most effective way to do it. It is, uh, it's so with AI, it's so nuanced and personalized and at scale, it's not the big one instrument we've seen in previous elections. It's gonna be so nuanced that you would say, of course this makes sense, of course this makes sense. And pretty soon at the scale that you've been served this information, your view is going to change. You're gonna find a wider gap, I believe, between somebody that you may disagree with. Um, and then uh, the, the last thing I would just say is that um, on this is that uh, one of the things I think is contributing to the divide and social media is a, a part of it, but in most of our life's relationships, uh, they say time heals all wounds, right? You, you have a big disagreement with somebody and pretty soon your tendency is to wanna to make up and they were your friend. Um, but imagine that if you had someone who was a friend and you were trying to make that up and every single, every single time you thought about it, you got a reinforcing message telling you that, no, they're, they're worse than you think they are. Don't even think about making it up. And that's these, these places we find ourselves, these bubbles or chambers or whatever you want to describe in social media, they consistently reinforce a view as much as our, our normal instinct as a human would be to want to move on and put things behind us, they reinforce it and they sometimes deepen it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're so divided and we can't seem to kind of come back together. Well, let me let me pivot off of that, Fred, to say with the rise of social media and these, you know, almost endless platforms to receive real time, you know, very fast, very free and, you know, sometimes unverifiable information, there's been a corresponding decline in trust in our institutions. You found that in your work, Molly, and that's, you know, that's 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 not unique. It's it's across uh, demographics, age range, et cetera, right? And trust in our institutions is an all time low. And, you know, those institutions have long been the backstop of being the arbiters of what is true and what is accurate and what is, you know, what it can be trusted information. You know, Governor Hogan, um, you, you, 
throughout your time in office, but I would say one example is, is during the COVID-19 pandemic, you found yourself as a source of verified, trustworthy information for you know millions of for six six plus million Marylanders and honestly, you know, millions of people across the country almost every day. And you know, I'm a, I'm a little biased here, but the the uh, the uh, approval rating and job approval shows that you know the vast majority of Maryland's found you to be a trustworthy um, person that they could you know you, you're representing an institution. So can you talk a little about how how you were able to get to a place where when you communicated with Marylanders, whether it be on social media, whether it be through a news conference or out you know meeting people day to day, you know you were able to 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 show them that you were someone who was a, a honest broker of information and gain that trust. Well, it's a great question, and let me just say, Amelia was a huge part of that because she was our communications director and then uh, chief of staff and helped us make sure that, I mean, if ever there was a time when people needed honest, direct communication, it was when, you know, people's lives were at stake. And, you know, we we started out this, when this crisis first hit, we were, we had experts at Johns Hopkins in March say that by June 1st, we would have 30,000 dead Marylanders. And that's a... I was pretty focused every single day. I turned over the operations of state government, the day-to-day -day operations to the lieutenant governor, and I just focused on COVID. So we had great, smart people, the, 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 the best experts we could find advising us. And I, we had to make really difficult decisions nearly every day. But I also thought it was really important to communicate to the people of the state what the situation was, what the facts were, why we're why we're taking this action and why it was necessary and so you know it was the worst you know global pandemic in over 100 years nobody had done it before we were getting tremendous disinformation and i would say the federal government wasn't doing a great job of communicating out of the white house uh there was a lot of people really concerned and didn't have the information they needed and so not only did we have to you know, stand up uh, you know, a vaccine and uh, testing infrastructures and build 6,000 surge hospital beds. And, you know, we had 54,000 people hospitalized and 13,000 people die in our, sta our state. Uh, we had to build all of that. But one of the, the most important parts of the entire thing was communicating that information to the public. And I didn't want to have press conferences every day, but I think for like the first, first like 30, 40 days, we had a, every single day. I was standing out there answering questions from the media and giving them all the information we had, all the data, all of the uh, experts' input. And um, I, we, so we left with, the, I think, the Washington Post status as the, the number one in America on the response. Uh, we had a 76% approval by Maryland voters of how we handled the pandemic. But I hear from people still today saying, thank you for how you handled it but thank you for communicating with us they were like our kids were watching your press conference you know that, there are people from out of other states that were tuning in or other countries that were watching our stuff on social media or on youtube wherever they were getting it on facebook or twitter and they were like he, he, he's the only one that's kind of giving it to us straight and so some of it was pretty scary information but i thought it was really important for people to hear directly that they were very confused and they were being misled all over the place with conflicting information on both sides. And I think in the, it's always important to communicate directly and authentically uh, with the facts, but particularly in a crisis, it, it becomes like one of the most important things. And so I'll give you the shout out again, Amelia. Thank you for helping us uh, do that. Yeah, I think I think you played a slightly larger role, but then yeah, I think the high governor. Well, Mon, let me. So you, you know, I think your 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 research gave a bit of a roadmap, at least a start, to how some of our institutions and the people that run them can start breaking down these these silos and these barriers to trust that is generating. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the findings that that relate to you know how do we how do we move forward and and break down some of the distrust that's built up in our institutions? Yeah, and it's certainly true of younger Americans, but it's true. Um, uh, across generations as well, so that declining trust in institutions, and um, it may have started, I don't know, 15 years ago with Congress, and it was fun to say, oh, you know, Congress's approval rating is in the toilet, and but now it's really spread, it's, it's, it's religious institutions, it's businesses, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and the media for sure, and so that that spread is really alarming because where does it stop? Um, and uh, it stops when we, you know, really try and address it and rebuild it. 
I think the slide that I showed about what young people in particular are looking for in leadership, and the governor just spoke about it in terms of authenticity and being um, accessible and having it be a dialogue, right? So that you're having a conversation, not presenting things from above, um, admitting when you make mistakes, maybe even admitting when you don't know something and telling people that's, you know, my highest priority is getting that information, but I'm not going to say I have something that I don't. I think um, the um, honesty and kind of transparency of leadership got lost a little bit in people assume that oh, we want leaders who are perfect and who are very polished and who have answers to everything. And I think that's created a lot of cynicism because we've seen that, in fact, on a range of social, political, health, economic problems, the experts don't always have the answer. And so going back to being comfortable with a more interactive dialogue, that leadership doesn't mean imposing a vision or asking people to follow without having there be a, a feedback mechanism. I mean, one of the reasons I actually like and believe in polling is because I believe it is an opportunity for there to be a feedback mechanism where leaders get to hear, oh, you know, gosh, this is what people want. I should rethink my approach, um, my, you know, not necessarily my policies, but uh, how I approach the conversation. So I, I think that's um, the beginning is to just kind of be humble enough to admit what you have answers to and what and what you don't. Well, I uh, couldn't agree more with that. I mean, do people often say to me, how in the heck, you know, some of my colleagues, the governors, both sides of the aisle or others, they say, how, how, how do we as a Republican, how did you win in the bluest state in the, in the country? And how did you get reelected? And I'm certainly not the smartest governor or elected official. And, um, you know, I didn't really have any experience at this. I was just a small business guy when I ran for, but the thing that people connect with was the authenticity because so many politicians are so phony on both sides of the aisle. I call it performative politics where they're, it's all spin and it's all hype. And people said, came, come up to me today and they go, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I never voted for Republican in my life, but you seem like a regular guy. You always gave it to us straight. Or they say, I don't even agree with you on everything, but I really do appreciate that you're you're authentic. You're like the real deal. And I think you know, it's like a unicorn because there's nobody in politics that's the regular. They go, you seem like a regular guy. And I go, that's because I am a regular guy. <laughs> you know? And I think it's missing because politics is so phony these days. Uh, Rohan, I want to go to you. I think, do we have some slides on social media? I want to, okay, so I think this is a good way to pivot. Uh, obviously, please, please comment on um, anything about, you know, institutions. I think this all will relate, right? So um, I will say, I made this slide. It's some of examples of throughout the generations of what I call political cringe, um, where, you know, politicians are trying very, very, very hard to seem normal and relate to young kids. And so, Rohan, I'd love to just get, you know, your, your general take on Social media obviously has enormous potential, but it often, often our leaders and institutions just get it wrong. Um, discuss, how can we avoid the crash? Um, I would say 90% uh, of it goes not the right direction. Um, it's very much, how do you do, fellow kids? Yes, it definitely feels that way. Um, wow. So the there's a lot of different examples, I think, of how this goes awry. And I think a lot of it is, yeah. <laughs> I'm just chilling. It's I still remember Vine, IP Vine, um, where <laughs> she goes on there and you can hear like this like I'm just chilling and she like taps hard on the screen and says in Cedar Rapids and it just does not feel authentic. Like, you can tell she has never made a Vine before in her life and you know what that's okay. Um, but you a lot of this stuff is because you pick up terms that you think kids are saying and you put them in the context that doesn't make any sense um pokemon go to the polls that's a great one um don't entirely know what pokemon go has to do with going to the polls but love that um it's just one of those things where it's like if you're trying to you know talk to people who are maybe not in the same generational lane like you kind of want to understand the terms before using them um, otherwise, it could go a very wrong direction. The Trump Force Ones, that was really cool. Trump trying to appeal to um, sneakerheads. 
I saw on the news that um, apparently the reason was because he wanted to pander to more urban populations. Um, you can take that as you will. Um, bad merch. I don't know what totes for Joe means. <laughs> if anyone can help me with that one. Um, Chillery Clinton uh, from the I'm Just Chilling in Cedar Rapids fame. Um, Trump Force ones again, won't let me go. Um, and then there is the Elizabeth Warren merch, which is still being sold, by the way, which is I'm running for president because that's what girls do. Iconic, but it would be great on Etsy, not from a politician. It does not make it feels very performative from a politician. Um, but the Etsy idea, I would love that shirt on Etsy. I would buy that. Um, the John Delaney merch is confusing. I don't know what how a memory eraser is going to work. I wish the memory eraser would work so that I could get that out of my mind. Um, so there's a lot of moments where I, I I just feel very confused looking at some of the stuff because it does not make sense. Like I see what you were trying to do except for the totes for Joe, but I don't know if it landed. It did not land actually. So it's if you're gonna try to talk to people like at least get where we're coming from have a young person on your team maybe <laughs> oh, yeah um i think there's more possibly okay love that so then yeah but these are just some examples there's many more um also the on the previous slide there was nancy pelosi talking about um tic-tac-toe it's a winner that one's really recent that was from the house passing the tiktok bill um i don't think tiktok is about tic-tac-toe uh, but um, it's fine. So it's just one of those things where you have to understand people. It comes across as very inauthentic. It comes across as cringe. It does not make me want to Pokemon go to the polls for you. Um, I think I can say that on the behalf of many of my fellow Gen Zers. The, the thing, so, so, you know, look, obviously it's funny, right? It's then these are all, um, I tried to include some even past pre-social media politicians were still doing this. They were still trying really hard. We have Mike Dukakis and, and George H.W. over there trying to look like regular people or adjust for some sort of a weakness in a very invisible way, like Dukakis in the tank. Um, in seriousness, like, what are they supposed to do, right? Like, how can they, how can politicians talk to people in this, in, in this generation? Um, and then I would say political leaders, institutions, whatever it is, like the older people in a way that is is persuasive, it meets them where they are, um, but is not, you know, trying to part. Like, what do you guys want to see from your leaders? I mean, I, I, I get it. It can be hard to talk across generational lines. But uh, again, like, what about having a young person on your communications team? That could be a cool idea. Um, them actually like knowing what's popular would be nice. Um, but I also think like being an approachable person, I think the idea like was mentioned of, you know, this very perfect prim and proper politician. I don't think that that's what anyone wants to see anymore. And I also think that it makes you very removed from society. Um, you kind of, again, end up in your own bubble, not social media created of, you know, trying to be like the upstanding, like, you know, nice steamed suit and tie kind of person, but that's not what real life is. Like, as soon as this event is over, I'm not wearing the suit anymore. I'm just letting y'all know. Um, like, you can be that person who does not have to, who, who doesn't look like they sleep in their suit. Like, you can be a normal person. And I think that's what we're really looking for. So just including young people in the conversation, I think is super important. Even just running it by a young person would be fantastic. Um, but also just not necessarily trying to portray yourself as that, you know, politician, portray yourself as an actual human being. Yeah, we'll open it for questions in a bit, but I'd love Molly, so if you want to weigh in on this or anything related. Uh, I, in a previous life, was involved in running uh, campaigns, and I remember kind of one of the gimmicks that we used that was really popular for, I don't know, like three or four election cycles, I don't know, maybe late 90s, 2000. 2006 was for a candidate to go out and do a work day, you know, where they would spend the day on the job on a job with somebody, you know, working at a factory or being a bus driver or and it was like a really staged attempt to show their authenticity that they were just going to be a regular person. Those worked for a while before they kind of didn't pass the smell test as being real anymore. 
But if you think about what the equivalent of that is today, right, maybe it is having a panel of young advisors spending the day with them or going to class with them and understanding what it's like, or, you know, having dinner with your um, constituents in their home where there's not media invited and, and that it's not staged. But that real, I think what um, we hear a lot in the polling and in other research that we do, young people craving is that sense of connection that you really bothered to hear and understand me before you ask me what it is that I can do for you, whether it's to vote for you or to support my policies around something you've bothered or you've showed you've bothered to understand me, you've showed enough respect for my situation to kind of, you know, spend, whether it's a few hours, a few days in, in my shoes and living a different experience. And so if we could come up with the kind of new version of what a, you know, a work day from 20 years ago um, would be, I think it would be spending the day with somebody and really kind of going around in their routines and seeing what it's like to drop off kids and then run to the market and then get to your job and then be on, you know, be texting your boss. And that that's really stressful. And I think people have a sense that elected leaders don't live that life, right? They're protected and they're cushioned from it. They don't feel the pressure that I feel. So that proof I think is is really important to be able to demonstrate. I'll see if you go to Fred and then Governor you want to yeah, finish sure. this out. Okay. Some more questions? Um, well, I, just on the, on the merch, uh, you know, there's the saying, you, you can't fake authenticity. And uh, one of the, uh, when I was involved in some campaigns, we had this image that would quickly turn people off when they started to go with these crazy things. We'd say, you are imagining your grandfather in tight jeans. Uh, and it was like, that's an image no one wants. It doesn't fit. It's incongruent. So anytime you see a candidate in, you know, if you think your godfather, your, your grandfather in skinny jeans, it's like, no, that, that's not working. Um, but it's it's not just, it, um, you know, the, the Trying to seem relatable, we saw very recently at the State of the Union address, uh, up and coming star, somebody who I think has got quite a, a political future, Senator Britt from Alabama in the, the scene in the living room. And I remember watching that and I said, this is going to go big on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and in fact, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, but the, the last thing I would add is, though, uh, in terms of behaviors of political uh, officials, elected officials and all, it, they are ultimately guided by how their constituents react. If in the end, if the voters and the people they're trying to court reject certain beha behaviors or messaging, it, that will cause a change. And I think some of what the governor started off with earlier about the 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 rush to be on, on to get quoted to be on cable channels and to uh, to push the button to the edge of, of what's uh, of outrage. Um, that works right now. You know, the, the previous model, if you were going to advance in Congress, you had to have really one of three things. You had to either have subject matter expertise, know about defense or labor or education or something, know that area. Uh, you either had to have a knowledge of the system, the rules and how you could really maneuver things through, or you had to be a good fundraiser. Now it's how can you get something really outrageous on social media? Then you get asked to go on a cable channel, depending on whether in the left or the right on the cable channel favors that, and then you raise money off of it. So the incentives, the until voters and until people who they're trying to court say no enough of this don't do it you're not going to get my support if you do it i think that we have the, the risk of it continuing yeah well uh, i was just going to talk about the uh the, uh, the authenticity and connecting with people like i i try not to wear suits hardly ever now, and i i just spent the last three days uh meeting thousands of people across the state for St. Patrick's Day events and drinking beer and hanging out. That's, that's, that, that's who I really am. And people <laughs> seem to connect with that better. We'll put out this great kind of you know policy statement or something, you know, whatever we're talking about. And it gets very little attention because I, I think people are more interested in the loudest, angriest voices. And I'm like, you know, the passionate middle, we're going to solve problems. Uh, but the things that get the biggest reaction is when I'm being normal, when I'm taking a selfie with somebody at the, at the grocery store or I'm in a restaurant and people are coming over. It's like, I think the being for yourself is probably, you know, more effective than trying to be a phony politician. Absolutely. And I, one thing that I almost got in real trouble with my communications team, we were at Orioles opening day. There's this big bar out in front of uh, Camden Yards it's called Pickles, where there's like thousands of people drinking before the game. 
and I walked around there. This was uh, was it last year? Was the last day of the legislative session of two years ago? Two years ago. Uh, and I actually had to go give a press conference later, but I was, went, went to the game ahead of time, and a guy, young person, probably your age, Rohan, came up to me with a bucket full of beers, and he's like, Governor, do you want a beer? I'm like, sure. He goes, do you want to chug it with me? I was like, damn right I do. No, I chugged the 16-ounce beer. My press secretary was like, oh, my God. It's going to be terrible. Uh, this is going to be such a scandal. We hacked tens of thousands. They're like, our governor can now drink your governor. He's the greatest. We love that guy. You no, know, you got to be real, right? Exactly. You showed us, sir. <laughs> and, and, and then I had to go to a press conference after that. <laughs> that was the part, you know. It's a little concerned, but it's okay. It all went. I don't remember what the press conference is about, but we all remember the beer video. Uh, well, with that, I think it's a good time to open it up to our uh, our audience here. Let's get some questions. We've got one in the front row. Actually, this faster. Well, yeah. Hi, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Um, my question kind of starts at the polling project. Um, and it's really interesting to look at those numbers when you see all the way up until the last row there, people are pretty satisfied. And I was looking at it, and it's just policy issue after policy issue after policy issue. And then it gets down to the last row, and you think that policy issues are directly related to government, which they are. And then you see that everyone is dissatisfied, dissatisfied with government. So kind of to tie this whole thing together, A, my first, the first one of my question is why is the link between a dissatisfied citizen and their government having nothing to do with policy? And then also to pivot to kind of talk about the cringe politics that we brought up, um, kind of how, how do we get America back to talking about policy rather than like Hillary Clinton you, you kind of run a bigger risk of her losing a presidential election because of the Pokemon thing rather than her wide array of policy experience and her platforms and all of that. So I don't know if that kind of was too broad, but that was kind of the general question, policy to politics. Sure, I'll, I'll I guess, make a comment about, um, I think that young Americans don't see necessarily the connection between um, policy advancement and improvement and the way our current political leadership is, you know, the way elections are run today, because frankly, progress is so difficult for all the reasons that, you know, we've been talking about in terms of paralysis. There really hasn't been um, uh, 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 milestone events where people say, oh, that's an example of both sides coming together and really doing something for the good of the country, the good of the world, the good of this group of people who are, you know, are, are very much in need. So I, I think they don't have a template to be able to sort of make a connection between leader, leaders or not leaders, candidates, because I think of leaders more broadly, candidates for public office and policy progress, because they think they're just electing people to go in there and kind of continue that bickering fight. And that's really the cynicism that I think is pretty paralyzing. And I think what it honestly is going to take is a couple of examples of people who can break through doing that and bring, you know, uh, look, I mean, Democrat or Republican, the truth is Obama in his 2008 campaign was able to convey that to then young Americans, you all were in kindergarten or whatever then, but that generation of younger Americans in a much more effective way than other candidates for office had been. And so that was slightly transformative, but we've kind of fallen again in terms of our, our, our trust in candidates and, and elected officials. Well, you know, this is something that's not, I mean, your poll identified it with young people, but all polling shows all age groups, all demographics are completely fed up and disgusted with politics. I mean, you know, 70% of the people in America today do not want to vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump. You know, now 40 percent of the people in the country are no longer part of a party. They're registered independent. Or Democrats are only like 29 percent and Republicans are 28 percent. Most people, uh, you know, are really they don't have trust in politicians or in our political system. They really feel like it's nothing but paralysis and it's, you know, people just yelling at each other. So it's not a unique problem to people your age. I mean, I feel that way. Uh, most people feel that way. I was I started a group five years ago called an America United, and I've been talking about this kind of stuff. I can tell you there are people all across the country and every demographic and every age that are just as 
frustrated with Congress and with Washington and the political system as as you are. Anyone? All right, right here. I'm going to pass it back. Yeah. Um, so recently, when the bill about TikTok came to the House floor, the app itself pro started prompting users to call their congressman. Um, and as someone who had to take a lot of these calls, a lot of these calls were really young and very misinformed or even unaware of what the bill actually did. So what role do you all think uh, the people actually running these social media apps play in, ex um, in increasing the division in America? I think I can speak to that one. Um, I think that there is a huge kind of reckoning that I feel like we're having with tech in the last couple of years where we're realizing more and more that we need to monitor not just social media but in general the way that tech is growing and building and emerging and their practices and things like that um i think the leaders of social media companies do have a big um they have a they have a large responsibility according to me to monitor what is being posted on their on their apps what they're allowing um, because the fact is that I realize they can't sit over every single person and say, you can't post that, but you do have to have some guidelines, especially when you know, when there's a lot of research out there that people get so deeply influenced by what they see on social media, no matter how real or fake it is. Um, and these companies not willing to take that responsibility on their own is uh, one of the most problematic things that I think we're facing um, as a country and even as a world. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, Facebook is not, you know, United States specific. It is all over the world. Everyone uses it. Most people use it. Um, they have a big responsibility to monitor what is being posted, um, monitor who is making an account, make sure that the process of making an account requires you to be an actual human being and that you're not, you know, a million bots that are created to just spam people. Um, they, they have a big, big responsibility that they're not willing to take on, whether that's because they just don't want to, or whether it's because it's more expensive for them to do so. Um, the thing with banning TikTok specifically, um, personally, what I found interesting was I felt like it happened very quickly when there's a lot of bills that we have been trying to pass for like everyday things that have not happened quite as quickly. Um, and I think in that situation, we also need to reevaluate our priorities. Um, when it comes to even talking about things like inflation, we hear the stock market and all these different things. What about someone who's living paycheck to paycheck who's not investing? My problem is food. My problem is, you know, making sure that I have a job, that I can have a house. Rent prices are up like crazy. It's almost impossible to buy a home in this country at this point. What about those issues? Like, are we going to talk about that at some point? Like the very bottom line base issues that affect every single human being on an everyday basis, things that allow me to survive, literally. Um, so there's a lot of things that we need to talk about because even when it comes to the authenticity, it doesn't feel very authentic that you felt like banning TikTok, so you banned it. Well, then what you didn't feel like making sure food was affordable. You didn't feel like making sure prescription drugs were affordable, that it's been taking years that we've been having conversations on some of these things. Um, and so it's definitely social media, platforms do have a responsibility, but I think it also makes us look at the responsibility of our elected officials um, towards us. We have time for one more. I have a question um, for Mr. Ryan, but for anyone, uh, just with your experience in the White House and then journalism through a lot of different political climates, do you really think that we're in this like new, unprecedented, extremely polarized, never before seen era of politics or 10 years from now, are we all going to think like, well, that actually wasn't unprecedented. Like it's, it's not new. You know, we dealt with that 10 years ago. Is it getting worse? <laughs> well, I, I do think we're in a, a level of polarization and division that we've never seen before. And I think it's for a lot of the reasons that we've been talking about. Uh, it's, um, it, you know, previously, and, and I, when I was there, Ronald Reagan was the president and the leader, the speaker of the house was Tip O'Neill. He was Democrat from a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts. Ronald Reagan was a conservative Republican from the West. 
they disagreed on almost every issue, but they could get together at night and have a beer talk, and then they, the channels were open to communicate. Today, I think there is a difference, though, my own view, and, and uh, Governor Hogan has got firsthand experience with this, so could maybe even be more clear than I could be, but in, I think there's a difference between the governors and uh, in Congress. In Congress, if you make a lot of noise and you're on social media a lot and you can come back and tell your constituents, I stopped everything they tried to do. That's, some people say, great, keep, keep it up. We'll send you back. We don't like what they're trying to do. Uh, and the, the visibility and the, the cable appearances and all that just, that just uh, helps with the reelection. A governor is the CEO. At the end of their term, if that state's not better, if it's the health system's not better, if the roads aren't better and schools aren't better, they don't get reelected. So they, governors, do reach across the aisle, at least from what, what I've seen, a Democratic governor will call Republican, and, and, and they'll find ways to, to, to share solutions. And it's not happening uh, in Congress. But I think, personally, in Congress, it, I think it's probably going to get worse before it gets better, uh, but it's only going to be when people say enough. We don't want the games. We want to get things done. But I point would point to the governors and say, look, they're, they are getting things done. Uh, and, um, and, and maybe the Congress can learn from that. Well, uh, thanks for giving a shout out to the governors. Uh, appreciate that. Look, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I, I do, Lindy. I think it is worse than it's ever been. Um, in my lifetime, I've never seen this kind of dysfunction and uh, the, the angry, toxic politics. I mean, my dad was a member of Congress back in the 70s. And he was on the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment of Nixon. Uh, and he was the first Republican to come out for Nixon's impeachment, which was a tough thing to do, but he put the country above the party. But I, I know as a kid, uh, I, he, you know, he would, they would have passionate debates in committee or on the floor about the things they really cared about, but they were friends. Like after, afterwards, they would, you know, would have this big debate, but then they go have a beer together, like Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. And then I, I knew, like some of his best friends were Democratic congressmen, and I knew their kids and their families. When you get to go out to dinner together, um, it's, now you're kind of punished for being willing to talk to the people on the other side. And, you know, I, I, I was a chairman of this thing called No Labels. We have a group called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And it's a great group of about 60 House members that actually try to meet with each other and talk and fix things and get things done. And they're like attacked from both caucuses because why are you talking to those people? And they're supposed to be our enemies. It's really got to get fixed. But the governors are different. When I first got elected, I didn't know all the governors. I was just a business guy. I didn't pay attention to all 50 states. I showed up at this National Governors Association. They have a thing they call the seminar for new governors. I called it baby governor school. <laughs> but I met all these folks and I, I really couldn't tell who the Republicans and Democrats were without a scorecard. And they all worked together. We, I, I was a CEO of a $50 billion a year company with, you know, 90,000 employees. And we had to govern every day. Uh, but you couldn't tell the Democrats from the Republicans. We've shared best practices. How are you fixing this in your state? Are you experiencing these problems? In Washington, they suit up every day. It's like it's like the red and the blue jerseys, and your job is to go, you know, pound the other people. And that's why I think we could use some more, some more people from the private sector and some more people with experience running a state, and rather than just people that are, you know, uh, kind of cable TV, you know, stars. Well, we're um, we're just about at time. We've got apparently four minutes left. Is there? Uh, do we want to do some closing remarks? Anyone have a final thought they want to share? Oh, we're on. <laughs> all right I'll put him on the spot. yeah <laughs> i guess all i want to say is um thank you all for coming uh to this conversation and thank you all for being willing to have this conversation with a young person i appreciate that um and i think that there's a lot to glean from it that you know not only are gen z younger people 18 to 35 not only are we not a just one homogenous group, we all have different views that feel very different about different things. But at the same time, we're not that much different from those who are just slightly over the cusp of 35. I thought you were going to say slightly over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all we're we all want something better. And I think at the end of the day, that's all what we're trying to fight for. And I think that's something that we have to remember is that, you know, we all want the same thing. We all want something better for this country, for ourselves, for our community members. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you.
Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, thank you again to our amazing panel and our wonderful moderator. Um, we have one more event with Governor Hogan for our semester um, with him as a fellow before you become a former fellow. Yeah. Um, a fellow is almost tougher than being a former governor. <laughs> I, I just, I um, so <laughs> if you'd like to come to that event, we would love to see all of you there. That's going to be April 8th at 2 o'clock in MGC. So not in this space, but in Mary Graydon. Um, please pick up a postcard or a sticker or anything on the table outside. Thank you all so much again for joining us. One more round of applause for our speaker. Thank you for having us.